Welcome, everyone. The sports writers are here. Matt Williams, Nick Giannino from the Salem News, and Nick Kukuru from the uh, Gloucester Times. I'm Bill Newell, MSO News Sports, and here we are uh, coming to the end of August, and we've got all the ha- fall high school sports underway. Uh, I mean, we got real fall, not fall one, not fall two, but uh, real fall with um, now soccer, field hockey, all those, uh, tr- you know, cross country all working out this week. Football started last week, so... Gentlemen, uh, actually, you know, before we go into football, Nick Kukuru, maybe you want to put the wraps on us on the uh, Inner Town League, and uh, that has come to an end. Yes, come to an end Sunday. Um, Mariners, Manchester Essex Mariners, they got it uh, done in four games um, over the Hamilton Generals. That, so that was their uh, second championship in three years and seventh out of the last 10. And if you want to go back even further than that, it would be. 10th out of the last third out of the last 14 years that the Mariners have won so they've kind of had a serious dynasty going still going um you know the story was uh you know what it usually is and and uh this time of year Rusty Tucker the complete game shut out uh, it was his second of the series um only 10 strikeouts this time he had 12 there uh, in game one but uh yeah, he was dominant again, as usual, against, uh, you know, a really good Hamilton lineup. And, um, you know, the Mariners scored three times in the first inning. Hamilton uh, started the game, game four, the clinching game with uh, error, error. And, you know, that led to a, a bad inning. And, um, you know, it was uh, 4 nothing most of the game. Caught a coffee, kind of kept kept it in striking distance. But, um, you know, four runs is just too much against Tucker. I even, uh, you know, looking back, I think I've seen – in the in ITL action, I think I've seen Tucker allow two runs twice, and I've never seen him allow three. So once they got that third run in the first inning, it's kind of you're facing an uphill climb there. So, so Nick, let me just follow up on that. Tell me more about him as a ball player. Oh yeah, well, so he was a um, f- former you know, University of Maine standout. Uh, he was drafted by the San Diego Padres and. He was really on track to to go into the league as a you know a power lefty relief pitcher, kind of a late inning guy. You know he could he could push uh, high nineties there, and um, you know he had Tommy John surgery um, on his elbow. I think he was in the, you know 23, 24 years old, and he never really uh, recovered from that. He couldn't really get the same location on on it with you know the high nineties velocity. So that was kind of uh, that kind of derailed him there he was uh he was on the fast track until the tommy john but uh he came into the itl i want to say in 2012 and he was there for you know seven of those 10 seven out of 10 years he was there for all seven um still hits 90 he's 41 years old he's, he can still hit 90 and most players in that league haven't seen that before oh i wouldn't think so yeah great story great story um well we i mentioned high school football right at the beginning and high school football is underway We've got a few new coaches in the area, uh, a lot of returning veteran coaches in the area as well. And Matt Williams, I think it was in your column, I noticed where Peabody is jumping. Well, they're moving from the north to the south in the Northeastern Conference. So, uh, uh, you know, all these little things to pay attention to. But what strikes you first to discuss high school football? What comes to your what comes front to mind to you, Matt? Well, just nice to be back, right? I mean, uh, uh, seems like things are perhaps going a bit slow. I mean, I, I checked the, uh, you know, this preseason calendar here, which is a little, you know, kind of micromanaged, right? I mean, and I don't know how, uh, I'm sure everyone's following it uh, exactly to the letter, uh, uh, you know, but, uh, uh, you know, full contact practice, not until Thursday, which is like, you know, Really? Like, okay. I think when Nick uh, Kukuru and I played, we, you know, that, that was full contact. They would like, you know, you, you'd go like on, on Friday and then it'd be like three full contact practices on Monday. So uh, they're all dipping um, their toes into the water. On this thing. Against each other too, right? Wouldn't we Wednesday scrimmage Gloucester versus PVD? I think we probably played against each other uh, throughout the years. And then I think both of us would come back and have another scrimmage on Saturday. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was usually you start on, you, yeah, you start on Wednesday or Thursday. You had, you had, you know, we would we would do three practices on Monday, three practices on Tuesday, a, a practice on Wednesday morning, and then usually a scrimmage against Gloucester on, on Wednesday at four o'clock. Now, so that's seven practices in two and a half days. So you can imagine Gloucester would come over and, and kick the other eleven nonsense out of us every time. 
because I think that was by design, you know, to, to, to get the team a little humble and, you know, not feeling too good about themselves. Yeah, and then, then we'd go and scrimmage Tewksbury. Tewksbury was, back then wasn't what Tewksbury is now, so they, they were kind of, they were okay in the MVC. And uh, you know, we'd go on Saturday and scrimmage Tewksbury, and I think that was by design because usually we'd look pretty good against Peabody, and then we'd scrimmage Tewksbury, who wasn't as good as Peabody, and they'd kind of blow our doors off because we were so worn out. And I think it's just, you know, that was kind of our back-to-earth uh, <laughs> moment by design. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, you know, so 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 the the first uh, real scrimmage day for this year is going to be Saturday, the the twenty eighth. So I know everybody's really excited about that. Uh, you know, getting in, getting some thuds, some live action stuff here. Uh, you know, it's just funny how much uh, the game has changed in terms of the, uh, you, you know, the the practice schedules and the the drills and things like this. And I mean, that's every level. You see that in the NFL and college. You know, nobody's doing the kind of crazy stuff that they used to do 20, 25 years ago. So I think for me, I just was sort of reflecting on, you know, it was a year ago this week that the NEC said they were going to skip fall sports completely, right? And, and we were all banging our heads against the wall. We were all writing things, going to protests, trying to get them to play anything, right? And, you know, it, it just a year later, I mean, it feels like, you know, so much hasn't changed with, with all this variant mask talk and all this kind of stuff. But then, you reflect on the fact that we're actually having football and there's no restrictions. And, and like Bill said, it's not uh, the LeBron James fall one, fall two, fall three. No, this is just regular <laughs> fall. And, and I mean, there's nothing better than that, you know? You know, Matt, as you're, as you were talking, Matt, oh, go ahead, Nick. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, I'm looking forward to, you know, having a, a real season this year. I know the fall too, uh, it was great for them to get out and play. It just, it never really felt right. It just never felt like it was, you know, a real f football season. Um, and, you know, now we got something to play for. We got a new playoff system. Uh, you know, we got a, a slightly different lineman in the NEC. So, uh, you know, I'm excited to get going. I think it's going to be an interesting year. I was going to go back five comments ago to you, Matt, when you were talking about how things have changed as far as practice schedules. I didn't know you were that old. They had no rules back then when you were when you guys were uh, in high school. Uh, well, if they had rules, they didn't tell us what they were. They, they weren't <laughs> they weren't posted on the internet for everyone to read and you know print out and bring to the coach. Ah, excuse me, uh, you know, there's a comma here. You can't be doing this. No, you showed up. You did what you were told, and and you kept your mouth shut. Otherwise, you know, you'd be in trouble. Yeah, I said, yes, I am that old. My senior year was 20 years ago now, so exactly 20 years ago. So, yeah, I'm, I definitely am that old. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But, uh, no, I mean, uh, to Nick's point, too, I mean, I think the way that they've aligned the, uh, the, the schedules, you know, is really good in both the NEC and the Cape Ann League. Uh, you know, the open dates have been placed at the front of the schedule, so they've backloaded the schedule with league games that that should create excitement as far as league championship chases go. And, uh, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of excitement of tracking the, uh, you know, the playoff ratings, you know, seeing how much they change each week, you know, depending on uh, what kind of opponent you play. Right. Is it, is it going to be more volatile than than the rankings last year? You know, that kind of, or two years ago, I guess that kind of stuff. Uh you know, it's going to be uh, really fun to actually be able to follow that and, and, you know, really, like Nick said, sink into a real season. Uh, I'm very curious to see how the playoffs go, too, you know. I mean, when we get to those last few weeks of the season, and this is going to be the case across all sports, but, but football especially, this whole statewide tournament concept, you know, is there going to be as much interest? I think over the last 10 years or so, we've developed some really nice rivalries in the North. I mean, I'm thinking of like, uh, you know, Beverly's played Conquer Carlisle a couple of times. Uh, uh, you know, Marblehead has played uh, Wakefield and Melrose a couple of times each. Uh, Danvers and Tewksbury is yeah. a, a great example. You know, now you're sort of opening up that footprint and, and, you know, the first round game could be, uh, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm just taking a look here. It, it could be, uh, you know, Beverly against Mansfield or Milford, you know, how's that going to be? Is, is that going to create the interest, uh, you know, the travel? I mean, if Beverly has to go to, uh, you know, to, to Quincy, for example, like is anybody going to battle through the city or, or uh, you know, is the uh, is the attendance going to be down, that, that type of stuff? And, and that's going to be the case across all sports. But I think 
especially in football and, and to the, the regional power structure. I mean, you know, we've had some teams like St. John's Prep and Bishop Fenwick and Marblehead that have really kind of dominated the North competition. I mean, especially in Division One, I, I feel St. John's has really had Division One North cornered, you know, with the exception of, of maybe Everett. And, and they usually have Central Catholics number two. There's a lot of really good football teams in that South Shore that, you know, they don't necessarily have to go through, whether you're talking about a, a uh, you know, any of those Hockamock teams or, 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 you know, a Brockton, a New Bedford, you know, these, these type of teams, uh, uh, Attleboro, you know, BC High, Cal BC High, Catholic Memorial, and Zavarian go through each other to get to that Super Bowl. And the prep is kind of up here by themselves. Well, well that's not the case anymore. So, you know, are these North teams going to have as much success when they have to go through some of those South Shore schools? And that's something to watch too, I think. You know, Nick, I'm just uh, digressing here a bit, but back several years ago, back when you had those great Gloucester teams, they had a several runs of them, if you will. Who were who some of their matchups in those playoffs? Uh, was it Tewksbury? I mean, it seems, I'm trying to remember no, some of those. Tewksbury. So they, that was a different, you know, era where the, the, the um, playoff berth was kind of decided by the average size of the conference, not the school. Right. So they yeah. got, they got bumped up a bit in the NEC North when Peabody and Revere were in there. Um, so they, they played in one a, um, they had Westford Academy and Bridgewater rain in one year. They had um, Lincoln Sudbury and Bridgewater rain in the other year, but then you go back to the, you know, previous run there, the other two Super Bowls um, under, under Paul Ingram, the, the two, um, they got Mask and Omit in the first round of the playoffs both there years, and then they played uh, Hingham in one Super Bowl and one, and Duxbury beat them uh, in another. And that was Division 2A, so like the equivalent of four now, which is probably closer to where they are size-wise now. Actually, actually, they're in Division 5 this year. But, uh, yeah, those South Shore teams are, are good. Um, they could they could play with them back then, but I know in recent years, uh, you take away, you know, the prep in Melrose uh, – it seems like the North squads have kind of, you know, been dominated by the South squads uh, or the, you know, West and Central kind of late in the playoffs. Well, I think, too, yeah. the, the, you know, just speaking generally about playoffs, too, I mean, like, you know, when you get to a Super Bowl, right, that's one game. You know, anybody can have a great week of practice and get up for one game. You know, the problem or, or the more difficult thing about a playoff is, is it's a gauntlet right now you don't just have to beat one of those teams once at, at Gillette stadium. If, if you win your league and, and your Tuesday game, you, you got to potentially win three games in a row against a team like that. And that's where it really gets difficult. Yeah. And they get better every week in theory, uh, especially yeah, I, in this. That's the, I think the, the plus on this uh, system right now is they, they should get better every week without, uh, you know, going straight by record. There were a few glitches in the old system, but I thought for the most part it worked. So I'm going to, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, we'll find out, you know, year one, whether those power rankings are worthy or not. Oh, it's quite the challenge. I mean, if you, if you're, if you're in the right division and, and you know, not, not talking about Catholic Memorial and two or whatever, but <laughs> if you're in a division with fair matchups and, and you get to the Super Bowl, you earned it. I mean, there's no, you know, you, you play, that many good you can't have an off week you can't get worn down I mean if, if you win that many games in a row against really good competition uh you know it really is a gauntlet I think it's a lot harder to win now than it was then yeah easier to get in much harder to win I know a yep. lot is made of how easy it is to get in but I think they've kind of rectified that problem a bit this year I, I like uh cutting the field in half and adding that extra regular season week that week eight um because, you know, the consolation round does get a little stale, um, especially if it's a team that has, you know, won a round or then lost or has, you know, qualified for the playoffs and then lost. You know, you're only going to have one or none of those now if you're a playoff team. And, you know, the non-playoff teams, the consolation round is no different than the regular season anyways. But uh, I'm glad they cut it down for those playoff teams because it's not, you know, I think we'll see better Thanksgiving matchups because of it too, where there'll be no kind of lull period. There'll be they'll be in uh, the right mindset the whole season now for the most part. Yeah, I, 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 I do. Um, you know, I, like Matt was talking about earlier, I kind of do kind of lament not having that North South structure, if you will, in the central and the, in the West for some of those great playoff matchups that we've had that we were talking about earlier. But um, on the other hand, um, you know, a statewide tournament, I, I understand the advantages of something like that. Hey, let me ask you guys this. What, these three games that Matt, you talked about that the non-league games to start the season, 
is there a strategy in scheduling those games as far as, uh, you know, the playoffs and, 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 and seeding and that kind of thing down the road? Well, we'll see. I mean, I think that generally speaking, you want to play a team that is, you know, in, in your division or, or a higher division and a team that you think is going to win some games. Right. I mean, I, I think that that was always the, the way in the old system. And of course the, the max preps, uh, the max preps formula is secret, right? So nobody knows like exactly how it's calculated, but I think in general, you know, you, you want to play a team that, you know, hopefully you can beat, you know, that's not going to hurt you uh, physically. Right. Or is going to be a good game. And it's going to have a good record, you know, uh, I think for, for playoff purposes. I mean, obviously for team building purposes, every program's in its own spot, right? Maybe if you're down, you're looking to find a, a team that, you know, maybe you can beat to build some confidence or whatever. But, you know, speaking strictly for the playoffs, I, I think in general, like if you can find a team that is going to win some games and, um you know, is, is, is maybe that you can beat like, you know, in the old days, the NEC teams would schedule Masco because, Hey, win or lose, we know Masco is going to win four or five games in the Cape band league. And they're going to help us on our strength of schedule, right? If we beat them, that's a windfall of points for us. And, and even if we lose, you know, they're going to win enough games that they're going to make us look pretty good. Right. So you're kind of looking, I think for, for a team like that. I mean, you know, if I was in the NEC, I'd be looking at, you know, my old friends that left for the, for the GBL, you know, Revere, Classical, English, you know, if I can get a game against them, we play a really good game competitive, but, but we figure they're probably going to go win some games against the Maldens and the Medfords. And, and, you know, whether we win or lose, that's going to help us points wise. I mean, that, that to me is a, is a sound strategy, but I do think with the max preps being a big secret formula, you know, nobody's quite sure exactly how it's going to work out. Yeah. Yeah, I would think those would be great, good matchups to have for those non-league games, the uh, the Lins, Reveres, those kinds of schools uh, that are no longer in the Northeastern Conference but are now in the in the greater Boston League. Well, there's so uh, much history there, too. I mean, you'd love to just see the rivalries continue, you know, in general. I mean, uh, you know, just, just in general, it would, you know, you, you, it's just strange to think uh, – you know, a team like Swamps get not, not playing Lynn English, you know? Right. Exactly. Hey, um, and Masco, Matt, I know you wrote this week, Masco's, uh, they don't have a Thanksgiving game. I think we touched on that actually a week or two ago, but uh, is there any hope for them to get a Thanksgiving game at all? Or I mean, by, by this point, it doesn't look likely, huh? It doesn't. I mean, they've made a few calls that, you know, they're hoping, but it's, it's not looking good uh, certainly for this year. You know, I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe there's a private school that would want to play that, that doesn't have a traditional opponent. I mean, their seasons are are usually over by then. I mean, I, I know they played Pingree, I think, once seven or eight years ago. I'm not sure if that's something that would be on the table potentially. I mean, you know, uh, just based on the past. But uh, right now, it, it doesn't look like there's many schools in the uh, state that uh, don't have a dance partner. Right. Gentlemen, anything else you guys want to touch on and regarding high school football at all? All right. I'll leave that as a... <laughs> I got nothing. Uh, I hear you. Nick, uh, Nick Giannino, any, uh, no golf news this week, right? Nothing big, nothing huge on the golf. No, front. nothing big. We, uh, we do have the, uh, Pete Frady's classic coming up, the golf tournament organized by, uh, you know, the Frady's family there and, They've done a great job with it the past couple of years. It's been a, a, a real big success. Good turnout every year. Uh, some nice prizes. You know, just a fun day over at Turner Hill. So that's coming up next Monday, uh, 10 o'clock shotgun start. And um, we'll have a story on that. But figured I'd just mention it um, for anyone. You know, they might still have signups if you visit their website. I'm not sure if they're already full. But it uh, looks like it's going to be sponsored by ASICS this year, which is pretty cool uh, not sure what kind of donations they'll have but they usually have a pretty good selection of you know live auction items um not live auction i think it's actually written auction but anyway silent uh, auction. so that'll be fun what's that a silent auction silent maybe? auction that's what it's okay. called yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so um that'll be fun uh, in terms of you know the uh, the actual golf scene here we do have the high schoolers getting underway with the rest of the sports um haven't really checked in with them yet i mean today was or last week friday was their, their first day but 
today they got out there as well and they're uh, they're making cuts and everything so we should have a better feel on that within the next week or so obviously um you know the usuals are, are going to be right back on top i think st john's prep is going to have another great team danvers has some uh some talent beverly still has a, a little bit of talent left not sure about salem uh mask is usually pretty good so that'll be fun to to keep uh keep an eye out for in the next week or so um in terms of the amateur tournaments and mass golf stuff, I don't believe we have much uh, coming up. But that that season is pretty much wrapped up. Uh, just quickly here, looks like we do have the mid amateur coming up in September, and then they got the senior stuff uh, later on in the month and in early October. But all the big ones are, are wrapped up. Uh, most of those kids are are going back to school, to college, or or back to high school to continue playing so fun season on the mass golf though um yeah uh what else do we want to touch on here bill i mean um i want you to early too I mean, I golf is early we get we get varsity matches i think next matches tuesday next you know week. Yeah, only yeah, yeah. A, a week from today from when people are, are viewing this i mean that's uh that, that's coming uh that's coming right up yeah i mean they're gonna have to like i said make cuts pretty quickly i know a lot of schools might just have the numbers to fill a varsity team so they won't really have to do much but they got to make cuts and then get right into the action um, next week. So it uh, should be interesting. How about uh, touching on the Celtics? I know we uh, touched on them a few times in the last uh, few weeks, summer league and so on, but uh, you're right. You're on top of things. You're planning for the 21, 22 season. What do you think? We're getting ready. You know, I'm excited about it. Um, obviously I think last week we talked about their summer league and I, I jinxed yeah. them. Uh, I, told, I said they were the best team ever. They got smoked in the, championship game by the uh sacramento kings i believe it was you know they came to play they were, they kind of treated it like their championship they haven't had really had many good teams in, in the past decade or so um so that was interesting it seemed like they really scouted the celtics summer league team and and came to play obviously the celtics missed a lot of open shots but that's neither here nor there we're moved on from the summer league now and uh getting ready for the upcoming season in october they just released the schedule um, so, you know, um, getting ready for that, but team looks pretty different this year as of now, you know, with Brad Stevens coming in as president, he's made quite a bit of moves. I know maybe not exactly the, uh, the splash that some of these Celtics fans would like to see, but they've definitely gotten a little bit better. I think, um, you know, adding Dennis Schroeder, that was a really underrated pickup for them, just a one-year deal, 5.9 mil and he's going to fill a big role for them with Kemba Walker out of the fold. So look for him to, um, you know, really make an impact. And then they also, um, we also brought in Al Horford. They brought in his Canther back. They got Josh Rip Richardson from the Mavericks, another guard. They're really guard heavy this year. Uh, not really sure what that rotation is going to look like, but that'll be interesting. Obviously Peyton Pritchard, you know, had a good season as a rookie last year and he's going to be, you know, probably playing big minutes again. So they're, they're pretty heavy at the guard position. Uh, just not sure what, how that's going to shake out, really. Um, they gave Marcus Smart a big extension. They gave Robert Williams a big extension. I don't think we talked about that last week. That just happened a few days ago. So four years for Robert Williams, and that's a guy that started only 16 games in his uh, Boston career so far. So they're clearly very high on him. And I agree. I, I love his uh, his upside, you know, in the – in the burn that he has got over the past few, past few seasons, he's been very productive. He'll be their uh, best interior defender and shot blocker guy and can obviously catch lobs and he's lengthy, lanky and athletic. So uh, I think it was a good move signing him, um, you know, depending on if he can stay healthy. If he can't, maybe they can trade that contract sometime down the road, but they look at him as the center of the future there. Um, but just looking at the Eastern Conference as a whole, I think uh, the Celtics still fall somewhere right in the middle of the pack. Um, you know, you got – it's really a, a three-star league these days. You know, if you don't have three superstars on your team, it's going to be tough to contend. And Celtics obviously have Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum, who have come a long way and are obviously, you know, very, very good players. But can they lead this team – you know, to the promised land, so to speak. And I'm not sure yet. Um, you know, Tatum's still very young. He's super talented. He's been very successful. He had a good Olympics uh, this past summer. So maybe he takes a leap in that department and kind of takes over a little bit. He's at that age where he can kind of, you know, 
come into his own and run this team. Uh, so I think it all comes down to those two. But in the East, you still got Milwaukee. Uh, you know, they got three superstars and uh, Giannis and, and Chris Middleton and Drew Holiday. And then you got Miami added Kyle Lowry. You got the Nets, obviously, with, with Harden and Durant and Irving. Um, the Hawks are still going to be right in the mix. You know, they were in the West, uh, the Eastern Conference Finals, I should say, this past season. So they're not going anywhere. So I don't know. I, you know, it's really tough to predict. I think uh, it's going to be a little bit different culture with the Celtics, and we'll have to see what kind of uh, adjustments the new coach there, Ime Udoka, makes. But I still see them as a middle middle tier uh, team, you know, a playoff team. Hopefully avoid that play-in round as a seven or eight seed. But I, I don't see this team, you know, going to the championship just yet. I think they're still building for the future and one big move away from really making that leap. Um, but it should be an exciting season. Nonetheless, they still got plenty of talent and with the new coach, like I said, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of how I feel about the Celtics moving forward. I mean, there's still a lot of unanswered questions. We're still early. We don't start till October here, but uh, they got a solid group, but not, you know, not a top tier group uh, in my mind. Hey, uh Maybe we could wrap up a couple of minutes left. Uh, you guys uh, want to weigh in on the on the uh, Patriots? I DVR'd Thursday's game, but I haven't really watched it yet. So, uh, and I don't know if I ever will. Probably never will. But uh, any thoughts on the on the Pats? Well, me and Willie were just talking about it today with Cam Newton. Um, you know, he's he's out for the next five days now because he had to travel to get some kind of medical. Uh, examination and you know he's not vaccinated so they have those strict protocols where he's got to sit out now for five days and how's that going to work during the season you know they're going to be traveling a lot with the you know going to different games different arenas different cities um you know I don't know if he plans on getting vaccinated or, or what the deal is with that and then the other thing is what about his this medical condition he looked fine in Thursday's game I thought he looked good uh, would he complete like eight and nine passes and uh, over 100 yards and a touchdown. So he looked to supplant the the starting job right there. But now there's there's questions, uh, especially if he's not going to be practicing this week. We'll see if he plays uh, in the game. They, they're playing this weekend, right, guys? Yeah. One more game. So, you know, we'll see. I mean, I like Mac Jones, but I just think that uh, Cam was still the guy until he, uh, you know, proved otherwise. But, um, you know, they look pretty good. They <laughs> They really gave it to him. What was it, 35 nothing this past game against the Eagles? So, uh, I know it's only preseason, but they, they look good on both sides of the ball to me. Except for the kicker. I think they, they need to work some oh, things man, out yeah. there. He, uh, he missed some some chip shots. Um, so, we'll see about that. And Nick Folk is still not ready. So, we might be stuck with this guy for a little bit. Yeah, I think their key guy is uh, Stefan Gilmore. I think if Gilmore yeah. – comes in and plays the whole season. I think their defense is one of the better in the league and they're, they're probably a, a wild card playoff team, maybe with Gilmore in there. Um, but he's out when he's out, I think their defense immediately goes to the middle of the pack at best. Takes and, a huge you know, hit. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. On, on the passing game. And I, I don't think they'll sniff the playoffs if that's the case. So, and that's if with Newton or Jones, I don't think they really even make much of a difference in that. Uh, projection, but I mean, as far as those two go, I'm always uh, in favor of letting the rookie sit a year. I'm not that I want to see Cam out there, but I, I wouldn't want to see Jones develop any bad habits. Maybe take some hits that he's not aware enough to to see coming yet, as we saw with another rookie quarterback, uh, Justin Fields. Yeah, I almost got his head taken off uh, in, a, in the pre in the Bears preseason game. So, you know, I, I don't want to see anything like that happen to him. I'd like to see him sit, maybe get a little more muscle, get a little more. Uh, you know, mature in the playbook and then let them come out there and, you know, hand them the job next year. Cause I think, uh, I do think they got something with him here. He looks comfortable. He looks confident and um, you know, he looks the part. I agree. That's a, it's a great point by Nick. I mean, I, you know, nobody's uh, everybody's so caught up in the, uh, in the, uh, quarterback thing nobody's really talking about Gilmore like uh you know it's kind of getting a little close to crunch time here like we, we gotta get this guy paid up and, and taken care of uh that's just kind of a big deal good points yeah well, they don't really have a replacement for him so that's uh I mean obviously nobody's at his level really in the in the league anyway so yeah, they I mean, need him out there Jackson but we saw what uh JC Jackson is as a number one corner and you know right. it was Rashad Perryman running right by him multiple times 
Exactly. Yeah, I, I, I read from the uh, beat crew on Twitter about how great uh, Jay-Z Jackson is and all these advanced metrics and, and all this nonsense. But uh, I, I think that's largely because, you know, Gilmore's on the other side. I mean, I think we saw without him, uh, he turned into a pumpkin pretty quickly. Gotcha. Gentlemen, good stuff again this week. You always uh, you always perform. You always do it. I mean, I, I don't care who it is. You know, you guys are always there. So uh, great job. And We'll catch you again soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill.